do. Uh, joining us from the Yamaha National Headquarters in Georgia to answer some of our questions on the 10 700 are Derek Brooks and Philip Lash. How's it going, guys? You got on. Looks like your audio is yeah, muted. Yeah, your audio is muted. Let me see if I can unmute it. Technology. There you go. There you go. <laughs> there we go. We got you online. <laughs> Welcome to the show, guys. How are you doing today? Doing great. Doing good, yep. Yeah. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, can you guys, so we got Derek on the left and we got Philip on the right. Uh, can you guys give us a quick introduction of yourselves and what you guys do at Yamaha? Sure. Yeah, so my name is Philip Lash and I work in motorcycle product planning. Um, I've been passionate about bikes since I was a little guy, rode flat track, moto, woods, got into street bikes later on. And yeah, it's a, it's a dream come true to work at Yamaha. Oh, right on. Yeah, that must be really exciting. That must be really exciting. And Derek? Yeah, I'm the uh, motorcycle product line manager here at Yamaha Motor US. So I kind of uh, try to kind of oversee the whole motorcycle uh, business operations, um, try to give some strategic direction. I don't know that I'm the best person for that, but I, I, I make believe as much as I can. Uh, I've been here for, I think this summer will be 22 years with Yamaha. And 22 and like right Philip, I grew up, um, I don't remember it, but my father tells me I started riding when I was three on a TY-80 with the training wheels where he just unhooked the throttle cable and turned the idle up and I just kind of cruised around on it. So I've been pretty passionate <laughs> for especially off-road my whole life. Yeah, I mean, I mean, those are some of the best days of your life, right? For sure. When you're, when you're that small and then suddenly you've got an engine underneath oh, yeah. you, what, what an amazing uh, experience. And it sticks with you for the for your whole life too. So, I mean, having been in the industry as long as you guys have been, you know, how have you seen the the United States market or trends or interests change over the past ten years, or let's say ten or fifteen years? Yeah, really, since the recession, two thousand eight nine, uh, we've seen uh, riders put more value on the versatility of their machines. So that's right where. Um, Tenere 700 fits right in the versatility of the bike to uh, really can take you anywhere um, on street, on dirt, as Dan was talking about um, how well it performs in the off-road sections, but as well, it does really well on the street. Um, so that's a big thing that we've seen change. And also, um, you know, people are looking for the value in their, in the products. So um, again, with Tenere 700, our uh, value is our, great performing machine and then at a wonderful MSRP coming in at under 10K. Yeah, Ron, I mean, it kind of slots itself into uh, a gap in the current market, you know, which I think is is, is, is awesome. I think we've seen uh, recently some of the smaller displacement adventure bikes develop and some of the much larger displacement adventure bikes, but there's a whole lot of people that are out there banging pots and pans for things that are, you know, more in the, in, in the mid size. So where do you guys see the T7 fitting into the current, you know, uh, motorcycle landscape. Um, and what do you believe makes it different from some of the other options that are out there? Yeah, yeah I, I guess I can go. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I, I think you just, Philip mentioned it and you just hit on it. Really, it, we think it has a pretty unique position. Um, and that was by design. I mean, that was our concept from the beginning, kind of a midsize, uh, more off-road, more kind of rally-inspired adventure bike. But really, it, it, it a very... Uh, value price. Um, you know, we have pretty amazing engineers that are more than capable of building, you know, R1M super bikes with huge horsepower and incredible technology, but, but we really set out to make this bike extremely usable, um, easy to ride, but also extremely fun and feel like you're really connected to the machine um, and really no frills. And again, at a value proposition. So, I think there's a lot of really amazing motorcycles out there. I like to think we make some of them, but besides our brand, there's a lot of other really amazing bikes. But I really think we do have a kind of unique position with the Tenere 700 with the, the function it has and the price it's at. Yeah, yeah, I, I would I'd probably agree. So, you know, uh, one, of the, one of the problems with the, I want to say it's a problem, but one of the challenges of these adventure and dual sport bikes is, you know, you've got to make these bikes suitable for everything. You know, um, and, and you don't have that so much in the other genres 
or categories of bikes uh, that we found traditionally in the United States. You know, um, what are some of the challenges of designing a cross-purpose bike like this T7? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I think, like, once again, you kind of hit the nail on the head when you asked the question. It's, it's a dual-purpose bike, so it needs to um, work well on the street and the dirt. And with this concept, we really focus on the functionality and the off-road ability of the bike. So, you know, riding it on gravel roads, dirt trails, getting on OHV trails, it's, it's a ball. But then you still has to function really well on the street. And I think uh, Dan talked about it on his review a little bit. Uh, with the windshield, it really creates a nice pocket for you. It has the hand guards to keep the wind off, low vibration. It has rubber in the foot pegs. So again, to help with uh, transferring vibration of the rider, then you can pop out with no tools when you get to an off-road section if you want more grip. So yeah, these are some of the things that really make T7 special. Yeah, and I could I could awesome. maybe also just to add, you know, I, I mentioned it just a minute ago, but that in some ways developing a bike with dual function like this is, is much more difficult than developing a YZ, a motocross bike or a super sport bike because they are hyper monofocused. So, you know, you, 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 you set out the design requirements, what, you know, we call a QFD and, and what you're gonna measure and what the function needs to be on every exact situation. And it can be really fine tuned to that one purpose. And it's not easy, but at least it's one thing you're trying to achieve with a dual function bike like this. It's a challenge. I mean, as Philip said, you, you want, you have to say, all right, what's the concept for the machine? So you set all your targets for development towards that, that situation. But at the same time, you, you got to realize, well, we can say that we're going to make a great off-road uh, bike, but at the same time, somebody may buy it and ride it 99% of the time on, on the street. So we can't ignore that. So you have to find this balance of, of the design, of the development, of the settings. And, you know, I, I think the engineers did a really good job. I think the brakes, I, we were talking about at the, at the event, I think the brakes are a great example. Uh, you know, they're high quality brakes Brembo's, but um, you know, we've heard some, uh, to be quite honest, we heard some initial feedback, I think more so from, from the European side that the initial feel felt a little bit soft. Well, well it does by design. Yeah. Um, and Dan, you mentioned it a little bit earlier, you know, the last thing you want when you're cruising down a gravel road at 20, 25 miles an hour is to just touch the brake and have it lock up. We would never do that. You know, we want, yeah. we, we need the bike to, to handle extremely well. Um, and, and I think that's kind of Yamaha's asset in their uh, engineering capabilities and design to be able to really fine tune all the components and suspension um, and make not just, again, with a, a hyper-focused machine, a YZ, you know, you can really fine tune the suspension to work in very big G out situations, but this machine has to work. You mentioned the comfort setting, but then again, if there's a 220 pound rider that's jumping water bars, you know, you can tune it to that, you know, admittedly, you're going to give up comfort. You're going to start feeling every little rock, every little bump, but you know, it's just like if you rode a YZ on a gravel road, you're going to feel every little pump, every little rock, you know, so you got to find that balance and that's, that's a big challenge. Yeah, that's a real challenge. And also when, when it's being presented to people, whether it's media or writers, you know, they're, you know, we're all coming from a background, you know, we're coming from street, but if you test a dual sport bike, like you would test a street bike, there's always going to be something that's not exactly right. Or if you come from a, from a trail or motocross background and then you test a dual sport bike, there's always going to be something that's not exactly right. Exactly. Right. So it's a, you know, yeah, you know, so it's, so it's a real challenge. So um, one thing that I really did want to ask was, uh, and this is for a lot of the general education of myself and everybody, I think, but a lot of people don't necessarily understand what it takes to bring a new model to market. I mean, I've toured some of the motorcycle factories uh, overseas and, you know, talk with some of the people, uh, and it really is an amazing thing. Um, but can you give us a very general outline, um, meaning, uh, you know, nothing that's too specific, yeah. Um, about about what it takes to make a new model and bring it to market you know like how long does it take and uh, you know and and what are some of the caveats because you have to kind of forecast you know down the road yeah right? yeah and you know I, I grew up in a dealership so I was you know from again three years old at my father's dealership up until when I started at Yamaha so you know I came from the side the market side where you know why doesn't Yamaha just make 
this. And once I started working here and I started in product planning, then you start to realize that, <laughs> you know, it's not just so, so easy as to say, hey, and next year we should have one of these bikes. Um, it really, to be quite honest, there is no set time frame. There's some models that I've worked on, we've worked on that have been almost 10 years of development and not technically mm -hmm. development, but starting with original ideas, concepts, designs, you may get a ways down the road. It could be two years down the road and you realize the styling trend is, is starting to change and you're like, well, we got to start over. And, and that happens. There's other projects That's we've been involved with where it's just, it's spot on from the beginning and you start designing with the, with the styling, you start the, the, the functional design and engineering and, you know, two years later, there it is. But to be quite honest, that's not, that's probably the, not the norm. Um, you know, it's, it's really, it's really all about recognizing a trend in the market or predicting a trend. And the predicting the trend is that's the magic eight ball, you know, mm -hmm. that's, that's one that, you know, yeah. one out of about every hundred ideas you get, you might get one right, but it is possible. Um, but once you recognize that trend, then you have to really start studying the market with research, quantitative and qualitative research that takes time. You know, then you start yeah. working with your styling designers, develop the concept of the design. Uh, and then you start working eventually with engineers, setting the, the, the targets for functional development. You know, then the testing starts and testing development is extremely important, you know, to make sure it's working the way that, that you have set out for it to work. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's not a short process and it's not an easy process. And I, I, I try to be very understanding because we get, I, I attend a lot of events. Um, you know, I still talk to a lot of dealers and I still get that question. Why don't you guys just do this? You know, and it's mm -hmm. like, I know I get it, <laughs> but you have to understand it takes, it takes time. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that it, it has to be designed from a concept, and then it has to be physically engineered, and then manufactured. Uh, you know, uh, uh, castings and moldings have to be made. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the whole deal. It's not a. It's not a. You know, like a like a like a snap your fingers sort of thing. There. You know what I mean? So, all right. So one thing that was uh, real hot here was, um, unlike a lot of other models, just sort of pop up. You know, we've been hearing about the T7 for a while, and not to put you guys too much on a spot. But, the, but uh, a very common question here is, you know, uh, why did it take so long, <laughs> you know, for it to get to the U.S.? I mean, that was that was been burning on people for 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 a long time because I think people really want this bike. I mean, they they really want it, and I think that adds to some of the chomping at the bit sort of feeling oh, about yeah. it. You know? For sure, I'd be lying if I'd say I wasn't chomping at the bit myself. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I can I can't go into a lot of very specific details to the of the situation. So um, with this bike, you know, it I'm sure your audience knows very well about the car rally, and it's really heavily supported by Yamaha Motor France. And uh, the rally with them is man, that is life, and they really pushed you know together YMUS and Yamaha Europe. Um, really together pushed, we, we wanted this concept, but to be quite honest, it was really their, they owned the project, which is kind of how we work it. Sometimes we'll own a project for our market. They're still part of the development, they still have input, but we own it. In this case, they owned this project. And, um, you know, they had very good intentions and we agreed with it. So I'm not gonna say that, you know, they were to blame, but the idea was, yeah. you know what? In this case, this is such an emotional project product, I should say, the Tenere model in Europe, that they wanted to bring people into the development of it, show behind the scenes, because pretty much as far as I can know, at least on the US side, we have never shown that early of a stage of a concept machine. So it was a, a decision that was made, like, let's show this initial styling concept bike super early, uh, um, just to get yeah. people to think that, you know, kind of bought into it and really kind of see a little bit I don't want to say behind the scenes because it wasn't really necessarily behind the scenes, but at least kind of see the process that went into it. Um, I think, you know, and to be critical of ourselves, I think maybe where we missed the ball a little bit was just that it maybe seemed a little too finished, you know, that, but it truly was a pure concept machine. Um, so, you know, that gave it a really early start, um, you know, and then the development process. Um, yeah, to be quite honest, it took a little longer than we wanted it to, but, that happens. It's, it's not unusual. Yeah. So, 
you know, with that showing that early concept and a little bit longer process, um, you know, and then again, with Europe being the kind of the host market for this concept, um, they started production for their model in the France factory that Yamaha has first. And then we transferred production to the Japan factory for our markets model. So that created a little bit of a lag. Again, it, it, it wasn't a mistake. It was part of the design, not necessarily what we wanted, but you know, we, we also have to understand that we're, we're in our market juggling 40 to 50 different models in our lineup. And at the, at our factory side, they're dealing with hundreds of models of managing when production starts and stops and switching to a different model. So yeah, it, we wish it would have been a little bit tighter, but it, it is what it is. And we've got it here now and we couldn't be more excited. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and I think, uh, like I said, people are really, really eager to get their butts in some saddles. Now, um, uh, are there, and I, I just thought about this, but is there any DNA shared with the previous version of the X-T6? No. No? Well... So it's an all new platform. Yeah, uh, DNA other than just the name and the, the Yamaha yeah, heritage and you know NRA yeah, and, and yeah. the car rally and but, but no functional. So it's all new from scratch. Wow, yes. awesome, awesome. And yes, it's uh, all new. The engine, like we, uh, Dan talked about, but that's kind of the heart of the bike. And this engine's really incredible. It, it you can lug it, you can chug it. Um, I was doing photos before the event and I was trying to get it to break loose in gravel and it just hooks up so good. It's like, you really got to work to get it to even slide out a little bit on the rear power slide. Um, and yeah, you can take off in second gear. And when you're out on the trails, I ride a gear or two high because the bike just really puts it to the ground. And then, yeah, with the chassis, um, you were asking about some of the development and we worked really hard on that to get, um, the strength in the head tube. So if you think about a traditional street bike, most of the force is from braking on the front and on the steering stem. So here you also have yeah. that force, but then say a slap down landing off a jump. So that puts different kind of force on it. Instead of trying to pull the front end under, it's trying to push it out. So yeah, lots of different um, um, with the DNA of Yamaha and our knowledge of YZs and off-road bikes and R1s and street bikes were able to put that together with this concept. Awesome, awesome. Now, um, moving sort of along a little bit, you know, uh, so we have this, this the sweet bike. Um, people are totally ready for it. Um, uh, it's supposed to be here. We already have some people that have already ordered it. Um, you know, what is the current process of getting your hands on one as, as you understand it at this, at this point? Yeah. So we, we have what we, um, are, we call a, a pre-delivery or pro, sorry, priority delivery program, PDP. Um, and so you can essentially, um, if you go to, um, your dealer, they can order essentially give you a special number and order it. This program, I think today is the 11th, right? This program, however, does in tomorrow, the 12th. Um, so the reason why we did that, there's, I think there's been some question about why we have this special order program. Essentially what has happened is we got, um, we were fortunate enough to have a allotment of production that happened before COVID-19 situation hit um, and interrupted oh, yeah. for not just us, but the world supply chain. Um, so in some ways, we're very fortunate in that we got uh, an initial allotment of production made, imported here to the U.S. Unfortunately, we do have a, a fairly sizable gap before the next allotment will be here. In fact, it's probably going to be most likely September-ish. I hope early September, but we're not positive yet. So we don't have this huge, massive volume of bikes to where we would normally distribute them across the U.S. to all of our dealers in a fair and equitable way. Um, and so if we, if we have such a small volume, um, what we wanted to do is to get them to exactly where people had desire to buy them immediately, you know? Um, so this was, this allowed us to have the, you know, a customer say, Hey, I want one, I'll take it. Here's a $500 deposit in there. Uh, you know, depending on where they are on the list, the hierarchy, you know, that's when they'll get their bike sooner than somebody at the end. Or if you, if you missed it, you know, if we only have, a certain number and you came in one after unfortunately you'll have to wait until the next allotment comes in 
But again, it just allowed us to get the bikes directly to the people that said, hey, I want on, here's my money. Um, and then the next step will be, uh, we'll take a normal uh, order from our dealers um, here coming up fairly soon with that second allotment. Again, as I said, will arrive uh, hopefully early September for us. That's cool. That's cool. We have a question um, from a guy uh, that's in the chat room, Bruce Harvey. He said he ordered his in November. Uh, a couple of blues have arrived, but I'm still waiting for my white one. He really wants the white one. I like the white one too. I'm partial to the red, black, and white in case you can't tell. <laughs> so the question is, how about color selection? I mean, uh, in, in the U.S. anyway, right, we're going to have the 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 blue and the and and the was it intensity yeah white we'll have all three colors the the blue the intensity white and then the black as well um yeah i i guess i can't answer when will his arrive necessarily but we'll have all three colors sure. for sure um and it's just a matter of again i'm not sure where he fought, fell out in that pdp program list in the list uh, but just yeah. uh, be patient i guarantee it's worth the wait yeah, right on, right on, right on. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, um, thanks very much, guys. Uh, it's been it's been great having you on. Thank you very much for answering the questions. Uh, I think it gave us some really cool insight. Uh, you know, we, we try to keep the, sh the show a little bit shorter, uh, provide all kinds of links for folks to go find out more. And, um, you know, again, thanks for, thanks for taking time out of your very busy day. I know it's late for you uh, over there. And, uh, you know, we would love to have you back on sometime. Yeah. yeah yeah thanks for coming on you're welcome yeah, right. thanks, thanks guys thanks for having me take care guys have a good Thank night you. get some rest see you